Welcome to the AgVisor Pod. Hi, everyone. This is Rob Syke here. Welcome to another edition of the AgVisor Pod. And uh, you've been following us on our long format where we've been doing our webinars with three experts. This is short format. I'm going to be reaching into AgVisor Pro and grabbing questions that are of interest to me and then reaching out to the experts on AgVisor Pro and having about a 10 to 15 minute conversation about the topic and helping you learn a little bit more about that expert who can be reached on AgVisor Pro. So welcome. Let's get going. So we've got Crop Scout Christy with TMAC Agro on AgVisor Pro here. Uh, the question we're looking at right now, Christy, is uh, somebody asked, uh, looking for help on end pricing, comparing straight urea to ESN. What is the cost to add a dual nitrification and urease inhibitor? Or what are the costs of straight nitrification or urease, urease inhibitor? Thanks in advance. So that's a question on AgVisor Pro. When a, when a farmer asks you whether or not they should be using some sort of a nitrogen stabilizer, Christy, how do you approach, uh, you know, dissecting that question? I think the first question we have to ask ourselves when we're even, you know, making purchases for things like nitrogen is how much efficiency am I going to get out of this material in the first place? What are my goals? And is this a risk strategy that I'm willing to accept certain amount of losses? There's no hiding the fact that when we apply nitrogen to the surface of the soil, I'll just use that nitrogen as yep. an example here, that it does have a fate and it isn't always inside of the plant, right? So the concept is in egg, we're going to buy urea, apply it to the surface and pray that it gets into the crop. But that's not a strategy. Um, that uh -huh. is the hope in a, in a dream, but that's not really how the real, you know, soil physics and soil biology works. So we have to think about how much of that nitrogen is actually going to get into the plant. More recent studies have shown, you know, looking, analyzing nutrient use efficiency in different geographies across the globe, that the U.S. is coming in at about 50% on nitrogen use efficiency. So if we break, oh. if we break that down, what that really means is 50% of the nitrogen we purchase and apply is getting into the plant. Where's the rest of it? Oh. 50 percent is going into the environment. I know our 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 grade in Western Canada is higher than fifty percent because of our environment being more more dry. We're 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 just a drier environment. So if if somebody is going to you know look at the trade off of making a decision versus well, I guess if if you've got losses that are potentially as high as fifty, you'll never get them to zero because of course we. We're always going to have some losses in the environment, but when a, when a farmer is looking around, in this case, the question is around ESN, which is a polymer coating versus nitrification inhibitors. There's a difference there because polymer coating is blending in ESN with urea versus the other ones, which are coating urea. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, so a polymer coating, um, and, and sometimes people associate polymer with plastic, and that's not necessarily true. Polymers exist in all kinds of plant material around us. It's a natural binding agent that's out there. Um, so don't be afraid of the word polymer necessarily. Um, but the function of, say, for example, ESN requires water infiltration into that prill to right. slowly degrade it and slowly release it out of that. Works like a, a net or a, um, more like a, a bubble wrap around that urea. There's other products that are kind of designed more to be a mesh. So they are a little less um, reliant upon significant rainfall to release. So depending on when your nitrogen is most important to be releasing, think of when you're applying versus when the plant will need it. So this comes in back into my original question of your nitrogen use efficiency. We want to match when the plant needs it as closely as we can with our application. So if I only have one chance to apply nitrogen and I'm going to use a material that requires significant water, but I happen to be in a geography that's in a D4 drought, say, for example, in Oklahoma, Nebraska, Kansas, and yep. any other points, Panhandle of Texas, that's probably not going to be an ideal match for what your farm needs. So again, it comes back to managing our risks of loss. Sometimes that's to the environment. Sometimes in that case, it's the lack of water that will prevent the nitrogen 
from re- being released to the plant. Right. So when I was working on silage corn, for example, or even uh, on longer or longer season canola, uh, I often would prescribe somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, between 20 and 30 percent ESN in the blend. And so that provided that release later in the season. Uh, I wasn't worried so much about stability early on because, again, our coal, our soils here are colder. But if, if you're in drier uh, and, and hotter conditions, then you're going to want to get that stability on early. And I, I think that there's, you know, primarily two things you're trying to control is urease, slowing down the urease enzyme, and the one is slowing down the nitrobacter. So that's right. Uh, for, that's where these uh, NBPTs and, uh, and uh, all the others come into account, right? Yeah, you're absolutely right. So the questions being, if I have that chance to apply and a material like ESN doesn't make sense for my application, there's a myriad of other choices out there. I have had a lot of experience in my ag retail agronomy era um, of, of dealing with lots of different types of stabilizers for different types of situations. We found that convenience in many cases... Trump- Are they very hard to put on and mix, uh, Christy? Yeah, so that's what I was getting at. Convenience really it plays a big factor when you're trying to push out you know, a lot of tons and get things delivered for the farm, especially if you're custom applying or if we have a short window with which we can apply. And so we want to make the best decision in that situation. And so stabilizing with combination materials, um, depending on your particular or environment details, um, you know, combination materials make a lot of sense. Something that has both an MVPT as well as a DCD, which would help to stabilize or reduce, minimize losses, shall we say, in the denitrification side of things after a rainfall event or in saturated soils. One of the issues that we have where MBPT can be a really important support for you in hot environments, in damp environments, um, even if it's cool and damp, you can still be subject to some volatility in that situation because nitrogen is so highly reactive with moisture. So when that prill of urea comes in contact with moisture, it very quickly wants to do something. And so yeah. we introduce an NBPT to the situation. What we can do is kind of um, outpace or or slow down what is really happening there with the urease um, it, it enzyme and slowing down that conversion um, while it, it while it binds into the soil solution. So. so what I'm kind of getting out of this is if I wanted to ensure that I was having a later release, then I might consider adding some ESN into the blend to to allow that polymer to release later on in the season. If I want to control volatilization and potentially uh, leaching and denitrification, then that's where the urease and the nitrification inhibitor come in. What what are we looking at typically for an addition on cost, and why would a farmer move in the direction of going and and spending the extra money versus just putting on more nitrogen? So uh, at the retail level, and I'm just quoting in U.S. dollars here because that's where I'm I'm situated. Yep. You know uh, the ESNs and other products that are a complete paralyzed product like a super U would be another example of yep, that. There yep, other right. there certainly are others. Um, but what we're dealing with is somewhere in the neighborhood of one hundred to potentially two hundred dollars a ton over what your raw urea price could be. So you have to factor in what your return on investment is going to be when you're making these decisions, right? It's a partially to manage risk, but also partially to stay in business. And so you have to weigh the cost of a material like that into the situation and see, am I losing enough to want to do something like that? Some of our urease inhibitors, DCBs, and combination products like Excellus Max, for example, is a, is a tool that is going to come in somewhere between $65 to $80 a ton. And you can treat the whole ton there without being concerned. Right. right. You can treat the entire ton without having the concern of, well, if I don't get water, it's going to, you know, I don't want to use all ESN because that's too expensive. I can't use all Super U because that's too expensive. Plus, I don't want to run the risk of if I don't get enough water, maybe I don't get any kind of release that I want timing out when my plant needs it. So we kind of lean he- more heavily on products like Excels Max and some of the other urease inhibitors, NBPTs, DCD combos to kind of come in into that situation is a lower price point per ton. And it has a little more flexibility to kind of suit what you're doing. 
the handling side of the equation if we were to coat the urea with those stabilizers? Do we need to have a certain amount of uh, of uh, of pounds per acre before it handles good, or does it get a little bit wetter if it if the poundage is too low? Do you know? I mean, that's a really good question. And again, going back to my ag retail experience, I I learned how to run the blender and treat blends. Yeah. Many, many moons ago, I no longer do that. We have an awesome team that does that for us here in Michigan. But um, one of the one of the considerations for that is um, if I if I bought my urea at a co-op or or at my local ag retailer, I have to work with them to make sure they can actually get the amount on that blend that I want. So yep. um, a lot of our DCD and MBPT combo products are somewhere in the neighborhood of ninety six ounces per ton. You know, three maybe even four quarts per ton it can get wet. So unless there's a specific dry agent or that ta- that blend has time to dry, whether it be in the truck or whatever, you know, it, it you have to take a few extra steps and considerations. There's other materials that are much lower use rate. Um, again, Excel's Max provides that at a, at a much lower use, yeah. 32 ounces per ton, and it has a patented drying process. There's some really cool things that can be done there, um, but you really have to ask those questions of your retailer. A lot of times a retailer carries a specific brand of um, uh, nitrification inhibitor because of its handling conveniences, right? right. So as long as it has some MVPT and it handles well, they're going to use it. So you need to ask those questions. If you're a farmer, um, it's important to have that conversation with whoever you're purchasing your urea from to make sure they can do it for you. Well, if you dropped in on this conversation and you were from Mars, you'd be wondering what all the acronyms mean. This is a uh... Uh, you know, it's an important conversation and and, and it one requires uh, a little bit of insight. So, Christy, this has been a really good conversation and uh, you're available in AgVisor Pro, but if you could uh, profile for us a little bit of your background and, and what people could know about you before they reach out to you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Rob. So, I, I'm Christy Apple. I'm an agronomist in Central Michigan and Central Michigan has a lot of row crop, sugar beets, corn, wheat, your traditional row crop acreage, right? Um, so I've been working in that market space for the past 15 years. In fact, this is my 15th growing season, believe it or not, and um, enjoying every single little bit of this. Um, I The last couple of years, the last five or so years of my career, I've added on some specialty crop advising as well. So I work heavily in the vineyard, orchard, and specialty crop space these days, and I have a lot of fun doing that. Um, and one of my main focuses that I've spent a tremendous amount of time developing is agronomy through the lens of soil health. That's not something that's traditionally taught in the universities. And so a lot of conventionally trained agronomists haven't really given the consideration to the biological functioning or the biological responsibilities that are taking place in the soil that we're being asked to manage. So I learned agronomy through uh, the lens of soil health. And so a lot of what I do has to do with nutrient use efficiency, minimizing negative impact on the environment, and maximizing uptake and utilization of the things that we are actually applying. Well, that's that's quite a dossier. And uh, again, if uh, if you folks uh, listening to this want to reach out to Christy, she can provide all kinds of services and consultation to you through AgVisor Pro. I want to thank you again, Christy, for your uh, input and your enthusiasm. It's great to have you in agriculture. 15 years, uh, 15 crops. You're just a pup. Just getting started. <laughs> So that was a great edition of the AgVisor pod short version with a great expert. Our experts are available to you on AgVisor Pro. Come onto the app, upload a question, get responses, participate in communities. Welcome to AgVisor Pro.